In the last session, we discussed the concept of the moles and calculation of empirical and molecular formulas, as well as working out the concentration in parts per million. Uh, today's topic is about the percentage yield. So what is a percentage yield? Percentage yield, how it can be calculated? It's the actual yield or actual amount or practical value divided by theoretical value into 100. Practically, because we are carrying out the experiments of this value, most of the questions, this value is given. And theoretically, theoretical yield, what we have to do or amount of product, we have to first find that and actual value my divided by theoretical into 100 this will give us a percentage yield so example if we have 25 grams of iron 3 oxide that reacted and produced 10 grams of iron and the equation is given so iron is a product here so practically how much we are getting from 25 grams of iron oxide we are getting 10 grams of iron that's a practical value or actual value what is the percentage yield so as the equation is there, we'll take the ratio of the mass or we can take the ratio of the moles first convert uh, the mass into moles. So 25 grams of iron oxide is there, moles equal mass in gram over molar mass So 25 divided by molar mass of iron 3 oxide. So that is 159.6, 25 divided by 159.6, that will give us 0. 1566 moles. So these are the moles of iron oxide. Then we'll take the ratio for iron oxide and iron from the equation. The mole ratio is 1 is to 2. So if we have uh, 0 0.1566 iron oxide, then it will be x cross multiply. So when we multiply them, it will come out as 0 0.313 moles of iron. And after getting the moles of iron multiplied by its molar mass of iron, so 0 0.313 multiplied by molar mass, so we'll get 17.48 grams of iron. So this is the theoretical value. Theoretically, we should get 17.48, but only practically we are getting only 10. And when we work out the percentage yield, the practical value or actual value, which is 10 divided by theoretical value into 100. So this will give us 57.2 percent yield and why we are not getting the 100 percent yield what could be the reason for not getting the 100 percent yield the percentage yield is a process uh, basically percentage yield in a processes can lower uh, through incomplete reaction so maybe the reaction might not be complete like we have 25 grams of iron oxide so there is a possibility that all 25 gram of iron oxide does not decompose or does not react with carbon monoxide to form this iron so that is one possibility there might be a side reaction what is the meaning that there might be a side reaction it means maybe iron oxide iron 3 oxide might react with another substance in the atmosphere or maybe the iron which is formed that may react with another substance so there are side reactions loss during a transferring so that based on the experimental technique example we are saying we have 25 gram of iron 3 oxide but when we transfer this 25 gram so maybe uh, 2 gram is lost so if that 2 gram is lost or 3 gram is lost during the transfer so we will not get the same 100 percent yield it will be lower then loss during purification stages Sometimes we purify a reactant or product. So during purification, normally it's like for solutions. So when we are carrying out purification, some of the reaction mixture might be lost, which result in lower yield. So these are the possible reasons why we have a lower yield for iron three of uh, for iron, as we have 25 grams of iron three oxide. Is it clear? discussion and the reasons why a percentage yield might not be 100% or it will be why it will be low, less than 100%. So you have to keep these reasons. Then 
percentage atom economy what is the percentage at atom economy how it can be calculated the mass of the useful product or the desired product divided by total mass of reactant or product not only reactant it can be or product into 100 that is known as the atom economy so for example we have this reaction what is the percentage atom economy for the following reaction where iron is the desired product so we want to produce iron and the equation is given that iron 3 oxide reacted with carbon monoxide to form two iron and three molecules of carbon dioxide so how to get the atom economy percentage atom economy mass of desired product so what is our desired product iron because we want to extract the iron or we want to produce iron this is the redox reaction in which we remove or uh, reduce ore of the iron so iron is our desired product as I mentioned so what is the mass of a desired product so when you you have to check the equation so mass of desired product two moles are there one mole of iron is 55.8 so two moles will be multiplied by two so two multiplied by 55.8 that's a total mass of a desired product divided by total mass of reactant or product it's up to you which one you want to it's the same thing so to, how to work out total mass so you have to take total mass of this all so when we work out the total mass iron is 55.8 and how many iron are there two plus oxygen 16 and how many are there three plus carbon is 12 how many are there three plus oxygen is 16 and how many are there three and then into 100 so the percentage atom economy for this reaction will come out as 45.8 percent so for percentage atom economy we don't need any experimental data or theoretical data what we have to do we just have to use the equation and check the mass from the equation of a desired product divided by total mass of the reactant or product into 100. is it clear the percentage atom economy then what is the purpose of this percentage atom economy the main purpose that sustainable chemistry requires chemists to design a process with high atom economy for example you may have two pro different process to prepare a same product example if we are preparing ethanol so how we can prepare ethanol one is by fermentation so C6, H12, O6 will decompose into two molecules of ethanol, C2H5, OH plus CO2. And the second one, is by addition reaction of uh, ethene with steam. So ethene is there, C2H5, uh, C2H4, sorry, because it's ethene. plus h2o gives c2h5oh that's ethanol so when you check as you can see when we have only one product the percentage atom economy will be 100 percent because mass of a desired product and mass of total mass of the reactant will be same so when you divide the same number it will be one and one multiplied by 100 that will also give 100 so this will have 100 percent this will have a percentage atom economy equal to 100 percent but for this one the percentage atom economy the first reaction that will be less than 100 percent so which one is a useful process because if it's equal to 100 percent it means we don't have any waste product or we don't have undesirable products in the reaction but as you can see for this reaction we don't need carbon dioxide but the reaction produces carbon dioxide that is not the desirable product so it will have a lower atom economy so basically the reaction where there is only one product then 
where all atoms are used making the desired product, then it will have a hundred percent atom economy. And if the process does, if a process does have a side reaction waste product of uh, waste product, the ec economics of the process can improve by selling the byproduct for their for other users. Like how we can check whether this process is sustainable or whether we can do it for a long run. So the undesirable products are there. So these undesirable product, what we can do, we can use them for another process and utilize that. Is it clear? why the percentage atom economy uh, like comparison is there so you don't need any data for atom economy or percentage atom economy you only need the equation then making a salt when we are preparing a salt so basically the reactions of acid are used to prepare the salt the definition of a salt when hydrogen of the acid is replaced by the metal, that's a salt is formed. As we know, like example, we have sodium chloride NaCl, but how this NaCl is formed, actually it is from HCl. So when this hydrogen of the acid is replaced by any metal, as in this example, it is replaced by sodium. So the product which is formed is known as the salt. And the most common strong acids as basically acid uh, and bases are used to prepare these salts or reactions of acids can be used to prepare the salt so most common strong acids are hydrochloric acid sulfuric acid and nitric acids so if you want to prepare chloride salt we'll use hydrochloric acid sulfate salt sulfuric acid and nitrate salt nitric acid the common reactions of, for acid or neutralization reaction acid base react because when acid react with base it will give salt and water so if hcl react with NaOH, it will form nacl plus h2o hno3 react with magnesium hydroxide it will give magnesium nitrate and water h2so4 react with sodium hydroxide sodium sulfate and water hcl plus calcium oxide calcium chloride plus water so if it is a hydrochloric acid it will result in a formation of chloride salt if it is a sulfuric acid, it will form sulfate salt. If it is hydrochloric acid, it will form chloride salt. And when acid react with metal, it will give salt and hydrogen. So we'll see bubbles phase. And neutralization reaction from salt. Bases neutralizes acid and the common bases are metal oxide, metal hydroxide and ammonia. An alkali, the soluble base is called an alkali. So all the bases, all the alkalis are bases but all bases are not alkalis and when acid react with carbonate it result in a formation of a salt water and carbon dioxide so again we'll see bubbles and then the salt depending on that acid we use if it's a sulfuric acid sulfate salt hydrochloric acid chloride salt is it clear the reactions of acid to prepare the salt So salts basically are prepared by reactions of acid. Then how we can prepare insoluble salts that normally is by ionic precipitation. <clears throat> and the practical uh, steps so example prepare first uh, preparing a soluble salt and then later insoluble salt and these are the methods because you should be able to write uh, in your own words that how a certain experiment is done so if you are preparing a soluble salt first soluble salt so for example if you are using insoluble base metal or solid carbonate so what we will do first We'll add a solid carbonate to acid. So, like example, a container is there, which is filled with acid. So, using a spatula, we can add 
salt to this then we add till what point we'll add we'll add until no more reaction occur no more the solid dissolve in case of acid react with metal like if we are using a metal or metal carbonate we can see the bubbles but in case if we are using a metal oxide we don't see bubbles so how we can identify we can identify until no more react so until unreacted is there so we know that we have enough acid we have enough metal oxide or metal or carbonate and this will turn into a salt solution then how we remove this insoluble or unreacted we can filter it off so when we filter off now we are left with salt solution so when we are left with salt solution then it's up to you there are two ways to extract the salt from the solution one is by crystallization another one is by evaporation so you can carry out any one of them after get removing the unreacted metal oxide or metal carbonate or metal so we can use crystallization or we can use evaporation using the soluble basis so when we are using a soluble basis in that case we have to carry out a titration because acids and alkalis are colorless so it will be difficult to identify the end point when all the acid reacted with a base so as it is difficult so first what we do uh, we'll take a conical flask After taking the conical flask, then you can use a measuring cylinder or a pipette and transfer that acid or an alkali into a conical flask. Uh, measuring cylinder, there are advantages and disadvantages. Like the advantage of using a measuring cylinder, it will be quick, fast, but disadvantage, it is not accurate. So instead of that, we can use a pipette. It the advantage it will be fast, quickly try. The advantage it will be accurate, but disadvantage it will take time to transfer. So we have acid here. We add that acid. Then we'll add because acid we need an indicator. We show a color change when acid react with an alkali, and we fill the burette with. the base and we'll open the tap and time to time we will swell the mixture so that acid completely mix with the base and when we add the base from the burette once all of the acid reacted now what will happen indicator will show a color change once the indicator show a color change we'll stop and we'll know the volume of acid used and we'll use the reading on the this burette to identify the volume of alkali used and we can repeat the same procedure without acid and alkali to obtain the salt from this solution the reason why we are not obtaining a salt directly from the mixture which is having indicator because the indicators are colored like they will show a color change so that will make a solution colored so if you try to extract or obtain the salt from this solution then it won't be accurate as the crystals will be colored so if we are using a soluble base an indicator can be used to show the when the acid reacted with an alkali and to produce a uh, salt solution using a titration method then repeat the reaction without indicator and read the you by using the same volume and obtain the salt from this mixture but normally using solid base metal carbonate 
we should ensure that all acid reacted and the product is neutralized and in case the percentage yield of crystals will be less than 100%. Why it will be less than 100%? Because when you are carrying out the filtration, so some of the solution will left on the filter paper. Even some of the solution will remain there in a flask or a container. So as some of the solution is still there on the flask or container, so then it won't be accurate. So percentage yield of a crystals will be less than 100% because some salts uh, stays in the solution and there will also be losses on transfer from one container to another. Is it clear how we can prepare the soluble salts by using metal, metal carbonate and metal oxide as well as uh, soluble base from soluble base metal hydroxide. Then to prepare insoluble salts, we use ionic precipitation. We mix two solutions and a solid is formed and that solid is known as precipitate. Example, if we mix lead nitrate solution, aqueous lead nitrate with sodium chloride, this will form lead chloride plus sodium nitrate. And when we check the solubility, most All nitrates are soluble, most chlorides are soluble except silver, mercury and lead. Most sulfates are also soluble except barium, calcium and lead. And most carbonates are insoluble except potassium, lithium, potassium, sodium and ammonium. So in this case, we'll take equal concentration and equal volume of the two solution and mix them together in the ratio of their volume. For example, as you can see lead nitrate and uh, sodium chloride, the mole ratio is 1 is to 2. So when I'm taking the equal concentration, then if I'm, I'm taking 10 cm cube of lead nitrate, I should take for a complete reaction, I should take 20 cm cube of sodium chloride. So when, when they react with each other, this result in a formation of lead chloride plus sodium nitrate. So to write the ionic equation, we cancel out the common ion aqueous substances. As you can see, uh, nitrate is common. as well as sodium is common. So what we are left with, we are left with lead ion plus chloride ion gives lead to chloride or PbCl2. Is it clear, this example? The ionic precipitation to obtain the salt. If the ratio is one is to two, then the volume ratio should be one is to two as well. If ratio is one is to one, then the volume ratio should also be same. Any doubt in this part? Then if we summarize writing the ionic equation for different reactions, so ionic equation for reaction of acid with metal, carbonate, base and alkalis. So acid plus metal gives salt and hydrogen. So what we do, we cancel out the common ions. So what are the common ions here? In, common ion in aqueous. So we have chloride ion common. So we'll cancel chloride ion. So what we are left with, we are left with two hydrogen ions. We are left with magnesium atom. In a solid state then in a magnesium chloride only magnesium ion we are left with as chloride is a spectator plus hydrogen so solid liquid and gas you will write them as it is their state and for ions the cancel out the common ion and leave the ions which are left behind same thing when acid react with an alkali give salt and water so when when we cancel out uh, nitrous acid is there hno2 so this is aqueous, aqueous, and NO2 is there, so that will cancel out.
then when you check the second one barium is in aqueous so that's also cancel out so basically we're left with two hydrogen ion and two hydroxide ion that result in a formation of two water molecule two is common equation must be written in a simplest ratio so that's why two 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 the ratio is one is to one Then acid react with carbonate gives salt water and carbon dioxide again we cancel out the common ions so carbonate ion is aqueous this chloride ion is aqueous and chloride ion is aqueous so we cancel out the chloride ion and what you are left with hydrogen ion plus carbonate gives water and carbon dioxide another example the equation representing a reaction between copper to oxide and dilute sulfuric acid write an ionic equation so first we write solid liquid and gas as it is so copper oxide is solid we write as it is sulfuric acid is aqueous aqueous and water is liquid so we write as it is then we cancel out the common ion sulfate ions are common in both so we are left with two hydrogen ion for ions we don't write a number in superscript or subscript but it should be a coefficient so if for ions we normally do not write like this how we write we represent h2 hydrogen ions are there then risk and hazards how the definition so the definition of hazard what is the definition of hazard hazard is a substance or a procedure so it can be a substance or a procedure that can has a potential to do harm like something is having a potential to do harm we call that as a hazard like example we say um, something is toxic so it's if you inhale then it will have a potential to harm or something is flammable or irritant or corrosive or oxidizing agent or carcinogenic so or cancer can cause cancer so these are refers to hazard and what is the definition of risk that is a probability or chance that the harm will result from a use of hazardous substance or a procedure so this is a probability or chance that harm will uh, res uh, result from use of hazardous substance or procedure like example if you are using a toxic chemicals or any procedure which is using say high temperature so there is a risk involved so something if it's having a potential to do harm we call hazard and when we are using any hazardous chemical or procedure then we call that as a risk like example if we are doing fraction distillation of alcohol so what is the hazard here alcohols are flammable they can catch fire and what is the so you will say it's flammable and what is the risk involved here that risk is that um, it can cause fire as it is a flammable so it might burn the substance so risk can be minimized but hazards are there and uh, to minimize the risk what normally is done like in the lab we try to minimize the risk if something is irritant irritant is a hazard so what we use we use a dilute acid alkalis or we wear goggles so if something is corrosive and these are like normally the irritants are dilute acids and alkalis which for, and how we minimize that risk we use goggles so corrosive normally strong acids and alkalis are corrosive we wear goggles as well flammable so we do not directly expose to the flame something is toxic we wear gloves or avoid skin contact and if something is oxidizing we keep away from the flammable substance as it can easily oxidize or substance which can be easily oxidized are uh, place not place closer to the oxidizing agent so hazardous substances in a low concentration or amount will pose same risk as pure substance so if a substance is hazardous 
even like example so even if you use low concentration then or amount will not pose the same risk as a pure substance so basically what happened if you are using like acid strong acid so in one experiment you use 10 cm cube of strong acid another experiment you use only 2 cm cube of strong acid which one is having a greater risk a 10 cm cube with strong acid or only 2 cm cube when you are doing the experiment which experiment is having a greater risk factor a or b If we are using a small quantity, like in experiment A, we are using 10 cm cube of strong acid, but experiment B, we are only using 2 cm cube. Which experiment is having a greater risk involved? So the first one or experiment A is having a greater risk. Why? Because if you are using a larger volume or a greater amount or greater concentration, it will have a greater risk as well that's why to reduce the risk we carry out a small scale and you have to learn the symbols for each like if something is irritant then what should be the symbol corrosive flammable toxic and oxidizing agent so you have to learn the symbol for each of these hazards Then measuring a volume of a gas by using a gas range, it can be done. So when as reactants react, they form a product, a gaseous product is there, so we can collect that gas. So a gas range can be used for a variety of experiment and the volume of the gas depends on the pressure and temperature as well. So when recording the volume, it is important that you note down the temperature. Modes of a gas can be calculated by volume, like volume divided by 24, that will give moles. Volume in dm cube divided by 24, that will give us a mole. And what are the potential errors in using a gas syringe? The gas escape before a bung is inserted. Basically, this part is not in contact initially. The bung is not placed from the beginning. It is only place when you start up the reaction. So first what we did, we add the reaction mixture example A and B. So we add A with B and then after adding A with B, then we place a bung here so that the no gas will escape. But the moment when we try to uh, avoid this uh, emission of the gas or the gas release during a process so we should quickly close this bung so that small very small quantity of the gas will escape and normally what happen some of the gases like carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide are soluble in water so the true amount of a gas is not measured accurately like Sometimes the gas might dissolve in the mixture, so that gas will not come out from the mixture, so it leads to lower amount of the desired product. Is it clear how we can use a gas syringe to measure the volume of the gas? Then making a solution, how we can prepare a solution, a stock solution. So you have to learn the process. Like example, if I say I have two grams of sodium chloride, how I can make a standard solution of sodium chloride? We have the mass here, the solid sodium chloride, but what we need, we want to make an aqueous solution. So what we do, we weigh the required mass of a solute. So like example, in this example, we have two grams. Then tip content into a beaker and add. So what we do, like we have two gram of sodium chloride, we add to that beaker. And then we 
add 100 cm cube of distilled water so we add 100 cm cube of distilled water and dissolve it can be directly added to a this is called a volumetric flask so you can directly add to volumetric flask or what can be done so you have these crystals of sodium chloride and you add 100 cm cube of water and try to dissolve as much as you can so then the tip content into a beaker and add 100 cm cube of distilled water use a glass rod or a stirrer to mix it then sometimes the substance does not dissolve in cold so the beaker and its content can be heated so that it can dissolve faster or greater quantity can dissolve then what we do we transfer this into a volumetric flask this is a volumetric flask and pour the solution into 250 cm cube graduated flask or volumetric flask then rinse the beaker and the funnel after washing from the because we how we are adding we place a funnel here at the top and we add the solution so maybe some of the solution might left in the container so to transfer that we add further more water and then transfer it into a volumetric flask and then volumetric flask is having one marking like example here 250 cm cube so we fill it to 250 cm cube so now we know the concentration of the solution how we know the concentration of the solution we already know the mass and we know the volume and we, if mass is divided by volume so we can have the concentration of this solution is it clear how we can prepare a solution for different process any doubt in this part then regarding the errors percentage error uncertainty that we will discuss tomorrow and then we'll do questions from related to the topic any question related to the class today any question or a doubt So what we did today, already finished 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 we did and 1.4 is already done, 1.5 is already done, then 1.6 we did in the last session, 1.7 um, calculating moles and mass, that is the general gas equation is done, atom economy we did today. And then display typical reaction of acid done. The term precipitation reaction is also done. Displacement reaction that we'll do in the next session. And we'll complete this topic one, which is about formulas, equations, and amount of substance. So I'll end the session and share this recording with you.